pleasure to, to welcome everyone here to the English Theater of Lynn. We're so pleased to have such a great turnout tonight. Um, uh, dear Uther, dear Lydia, thank you for, uh, for being uh, with us to, to let us uh, enjoy not only this space, but to hear your reading in person, which will be very special for a book that has only just launched uh, over this summer. Um, my name is Sherry Daniels. I'm the cultural attache at the U.S. Embassy in Berlin. Um, your co-host for the evening with, with the English Theater Berlin. And uh, I've just arrived in, uh, in Berlin a couple of months ago after 29 years living in different countries uh, with the State Department. This is a great place to be, a very uh, a cultural mecca that I can only begin to start enjoying with my family. Um, this is part of our literature series, and it's very special to us that we're convening uh, here tonight uh, in this uh, special theater. Um, especially because of the literature that we can bring of voices from the United States, authentic voices, uh, uh, but also uh, special because uh, of the fact that we can also have intergenerational communications with uh, people of different uh, people, students and, and professionals, young professionals, uh, and, and people of all stages. So that makes it uh, really a great, a great series. Um, what uh, I'll, I'll, let, I'll leave it to, to Gunther to introduce uh, Lydia properly, which he'll do in a moment. I'll just say what strikes me as I got to meet Lydia a couple of months ago, uh, as I was just arriving, um, is the nexus she brings between having, you know, started out with, uh, with, you know, uh, maybe aspiring to theater and then studying um, both uh, both history and education, and then going uh, back and getting a master's in journalism, and really going through all of these spheres so seamlessly, and now not only writing for stage but her first novel, and you get to be here as she reads it. So with that, I'll say welcome and please. Thank you, Sherry, for the nice welcome. So hello and welcome to tonight's rendition of the U.S. Embassy Literature Series with Lydia Strike. I'm Günther Porta, I'm the artistic director here at the English Theatre Berlin. Uh, we will talk about Lydia's first novel, The Teacher's Room, and Lydia will read some parts from it. Um, Lydia and I have been working together for almost 15 years now, starting in 2008, when we produced her play American Tet, followed in 2011 by a production of her Bob Dylan play, Lady Lay, which I had the pleasure to direct. And um, a few seasons later, I directed a stage reading of Peace, Lydia's play about the Taliban and the beginning of the drone wars, asking the persistently urgent question, current question, how can peace ever be out of fashion? And I think that question is more relevant than ever now, and we're hoping to find money and funding for a production of the, of the play within the next couple of seasons. Thank you. So Lydia, biographical. Lydia was born in the American Midwest in DeKalb, Illinois, birthplace of barbed wire and the city where our novel takes place. She grew up between DeKalb and London and as a child also lived in Iran and in Japan where she studied kabuki and performed on the stage. She trained at the Drama Center in London and pursued an acting career in New York for a year before returning to school to study history and education in New York. She completed a doctorate in theater and wrote a first play inspired by the feminist idea circulating at the time that women might have other stories to tell and other ways of telling them. She's written numerous plays since then, including The House of Lily, The Glamour House, Safe House, she really likes to hate this, <laughs> American Ted, An Accident, and Lady Lay. All of them have been produced across the U.S. at theaters, including the Denver Center Theater, Steppenwolf Theater in Chicago, the Magic Theater in San Francisco, Seven Stages in Atlanta, and many more also in Germany and Canada. Her work has been part of theater festivals and playwriting conferences across the country and internationally. Actors have received nominations and awards for their work in her place, most recently the 2019 NACP Theater Award for Best Actress, for which she was also nominated for Best Playwright for an Accident. She herself received numerous awards for her work, including the Rella Lossi Playwriting Award for an Accident and the Barilla Carr Foundation Playwright Award for Le Lady Lay. 
Vidya also writes personal essays on theater aesthetics, economics, and ethics, and on other subjects like mass shootings and nuclear catastrophe for various online journals. Lydia has been back and forth between New York and Berlin for how many years now? Lydia? Many. Many years. <laughs> Several. The teacher's room. It's her first novel. It just came out and has, surprise, surprise, a female protagonist. A young woman, Karen Murphy, who takes on her first teaching job. It's the year 1963, a very important year in the history of the US. We follow Karen through six or seven months uh, that drastically change her life and that of the US for that matter. I was actually thinking of what to say about the book without giving too much of it away and came across the following lines on the book's back cover that I think do the job really well. Karen has a lot to learn and her female colleagues are there to offer advice, especially the enigmatic Esther Jonas. As Karen quickly discovers the devoted spinster teacher with no life beyond the classroom is a myth. The school is teeming with passion and secrets, her own desire for Esther included. The teacher's room offers both a panoramic view of a changing America and an intimate portrait of the hidden lives of school teachers. That's on the back of the book. So, Lydia, before you read from your novel, in an essay called A Playwright Crosses the Border into Fiction, you explore the difference between the difference of writing for theater and writing for a novel, and writing a novel, the difference of writing dialogue and writing descriptions and reflections. Mm -hmm. What are the differences? Oh, well, before, so sure if you'll allow me, I'd like to welcome everybody here, and especially to offer my thanks to the American Embassy. <laughs> wow, I never thought I'd miss any of that. And to Sherry Daniels, and Martina Scholze, and Kerstin Hitchcock, and John Self, who are here from the Embassy, but especially also to Martina Cole, who couldn't be here, because like so many people right now, she's not well um, and is at home. Um, thank you so much for sponsoring this event and for being here. And of course, to Gunta and to Torsten Richko for serving us with light and sound tonight. Mm, to answer your question, Gunter, I can't believe that you and I are sitting on this stage to talk about a novel that I've written because I'm probably the last person in the world I thought would ever write a novel. I remember you saying years ago, you would always stay with theater. I really remember yeah, that. Yeah. And then you changed your mind. Well, it, it happened suddenly, seven years ago now. Um, but it was a very, very complicated process. And I was thinking just briefly to try and describe the difference. Um, as a playwright, um, basically, and I'll speak only for myself, I hear voices. <laughs> I don't mean to... Um, uh, that may sound funny, but the act of writing is um, the act of listening to voices. And the voices create the characters and um, create the scenes. And so th there's that side of it. And the other thing is that I see a stage. So I hear voices and I see a stage. And everything that's going to transpire and turn these voices into characters happens in this confined space of the stage and imagining how the, these characters will then move in this space. Um, and of course, <coughs> novel writing, fiction is completely different. <coughs> and I should add that I'm not a person, a detail person. I could sit in a room with someone all day talking to them, and then when I left the room and I was asked what they were wearing, I, I couldn't tell you. I, I would have no idea. And um, 
That goes for descriptions of place. Um, I, I, it's just not my orientation. So the idea that I would have to describe a characters, often what they're wearing, describe um, <coughs> the rooms in which they're in, the world in which they negotiate their lives and so on, was a huge challenge. And um, so it took me a long time to begin to figure out that, that process. Um, but after a while, I began to have fun with it. And I pictured myself as a camera and observed characters walking through space and what they looked like and what they were doing and wearing. And um, eventually, I began to get the hang of it. And I, I should also mention that all, the, all these things I'm describing, the, the playwright leaves to the actors, the set designers, and the director. And suddenly I had to do all those things myself that um, are usually left to actors in particular. So that was the great challenge. But then you also gave it a very certain form, mm -hmm. which is a first person singular and present tense. Yeah. which gives the whole thing a very urgent, uh, urgency, and it's, uh, it's all right there. I mean, Karen speaks to us the whole time. Yeah. Why did you choose that particular form? Yeah. Which I think is kind of difficult to write. It's not difficult to read, but it's, isn't it? Yeah, it was challenging. Um, I did it because I thought if I'm going to attempt a novel, um, the most natural form for me as a playwright would be to write it in first person present. Because, and I'm going to quote Heidegger, and I'm not bragging, but I remember in grad school we had to read some Heidegger, and Heidegger uses theater as an example of the eternal present. Um, and when a character is in first person present, that's all you get is the present moment through the mind of, of the character. There's no past unless she reports it. There's no future, and that's the big trick when you're writing because you can't anticipate anything that's going to happen in the future. Everything is in the present moment. And so it suited me as a playwright because in, a, in theater, we're always in the present. and. Um, so, and the idea of being an objective third, uh, third person looking down at the world. Before I begin <coughs> to give you a brief idea about the, this book, the setting of the book, the book takes place in several settings. And um, one of these is the classroom. And I'm sure that Gunter and I will talk more about teaching and teachers later. But just to give you an idea of the various settings in the novel, there are scenes set in the classroom. There are scenes set um, in the principal's office. And there are also scenes set in the teacher's room, which gave the book its title. Very important scenes are set in the teacher's room, which is the intimate secret space of teachers. And there are then scenes eventually in the town itself, in the teacher's home, the protagonist's home, and in various meeting places. And eventually, there will be scenes in Chicago. So we've got a small factoring, factory and farming town, um, which I never aim, which I never name, by the way. I play a little game. It is really basically my hometown, but I never name it. And, and then there are contrasting scenes in Chicago, and I think later we'll talk a bit about that contrast between those two worlds and why it's important in the novel. So having said that, let me begin reading from the beginning of the book. The Teacher's Room, Part One, The Classroom, Fall, 1963. Chapter 1. I don't think you're an Indian, Liddy. The girls titter. The boys let out war whoops. 
I am too, she says, and defiance flashes in her dark brown eyes, those flaming orbs. There's enough fire in those eyes to burn the school down, but you fall into them just the same. She's starting a new game. It appears to be called staring at Miss Murphy. I'm trying very hard to ignore her scrutiny, but it's impossible to look away. She's making me self-conscious and I'm at her mercy. I feel tears welling up, which I'm fighting to contain. And there she sits, dead center in the classroom, like the earth's molten core, her tangled auburn hair lit devil red by the sun. The Illini were forced marched out west from Illinois more than a hundred years before you were born, I say, and I write forced marched in big letters on the board. But she's not impressed. She's drumming on her desk. She's very good as it happens, very rhythmic. If you close your eyes, you might be on the plains. Close your eyes, class. Let's listen to Liddy beat the drum. I hear myself say. She, she stops, astonished, hands in midair, and then she carries on. We listen, eyes closed. The beats rise up to the high ceiling and fall back down, reverberating through the body. The children join in, at first slowly, in ones and twos, until they're all at it. This wood, scuffed wood floor buckles under us, and the walls give way. We're transported somewhere, I don't know where, but the hour's up. The children toss their battered American history books in their desks and scurry off homeward. Don't forget your gym bags, I call out, or your homework, and have a happy weekend, children. You too, Miss Murphy, most cry out, but not Liddy. She's among the first to dash away. She's got an important job as school patrol on the corner of my block, wouldn't you know, where she directs the children over leafy South 10 like a New York City policeman at a busy intersection. From up the road on my way home, I'm stopped by her wild gesturing and fierce commands. As I approach, she looks right through me as if we've never met and blows her whistle. The whistle's shrill cry pierces the air, sending shivers through me. What have I done to you, Liddy? I ask her under my breath. Give me a chance at least. But she's already turned her back on me. I walk on, fighting feelings of antipathy <laughs> towards her, even ill will, feelings a teacher must avoid at all costs, I know. Poor Liddy, I say without conviction. To look at her, you'd swear she's been neglected. Those scuffy jumpers, straps permanently falling off her shoulders, socks around her ankles, that hair. But nothing I've heard about her home life. Her father teaches art up at the college. Her mother is apparently devoted. Comes close to explaining her behavior, which feels calculated to upend all my lesson plans. With all the sympathy in the world, life under Liddy Kaminsky's rule is proving exasperating. Two. Drink this, Esther Jonas says, placing a steaming cup in my hands. It'll give you strength. She sits down across the table from me in the tidy teacher's room with its long window looking out at the school gym its dog-eared reference books and teaching manuals sorted with care on the shelves, its kitchen, a mere sideboard with kettle, its rickety table, chairs, and in the corner, its lumpy couch, where Irene Bachmeyer, third grade teacher, is currently dozing, head back against the pillow. The coffee is good, strong and sweet. Esther is watching me with a look of pity but there's something else in her look, something like surprise at what she sees, and I find myself blushing. She notices and looks down at her lap. Don't look away, I want to say. I like your eyes on me. 
She's looking up at me again. It's tough being new, Karen, she says gently. Well, I feel old already, I tell her. She laughs in response, and suddenly I'm feeling better, able to admit that some of the children have their own ideas as to what should happen over the course of a lesson. I can't bring myself to mention Olivia, however. It would be like salting a wound. They're testing you, that's all. That's what they do, I'm afraid. It's practically the rule by fifth grade. You mustn't take it personally. Repeat that to yourself at least twice a day. They're children. They're 10 years old. Never forget that. And we're adults. Esther Jonas is in her mid-30s, I'd guess. She's been teaching fourth grade here for 12 long years, as she puts it. I have so many questions, and she's always ready with an answer, where the school supplies are kept, for example, or how to use the library. But then everyone's been lovely, from Will Lindquist, the jovial principal, on down to all the teachers, and Dorothy Hughes, the school secretary, who pretty much runs things here, I'm quickly discovering, and who doubles as our school nurse. Even the janitor, Cliff Johnson, has gone out of his way to make me feel at home, fixing my wobbly desk and the stubborn window at the front of the class. And generally speaking, I'm content. It's a kind of joy I felt climbing the stairs of the old red brick school building for the first time, up to the top floor, and stepping into my very own large sunlit classroom. And it's joy I'm feeling now with Esther. My uncertainty has vanished just like that. It'll all work out, like Esther says. She's here to guide me. You're right, I tell her, grinning from ear to ear. I'm the adult. <coughs> I seem to have forgotten that. You're new to teaching and the school, Esther says, observing me with some amusement. The children sense that instinctively. And as if that isn't enough, you're young. She stops and sighs with yearning. But that will pass in time, much too quickly, in fact. It happens to us all, doesn't it, Irene? Irene Bachmeyer opens one eye, then two, and struggles up from the couch to join us at the teacher's table. Discipline and boundaries. That's what the children need, she says and I realize she's been listening the whole time. You must establish order, Karen. Only then can learning take place. That learning took place in Miss Bachmeyer's third grade classroom was legendary. The children of workers who canned corn and peas, operated the wire and cable machines, bagged seed, built pianos, <coughs> small motors on the edge of town, learned as did the children of seamstresses at Brody's Coat Factory and the sleepy-eyed sons and daughters of farmers bust in early from surrounding corn, wheat, and dairy farms. Irene's children learned by rote and recitation, drilling and quizzing, methods newly under question at the teacher's college, but that didn't stop the children from learning. And without exception, they were held to the highest standards and expectations. And learning is the goal, is it not, after all? She stops, short, chin held high, waiting for an answer. I nod my consent under her stern gaze and struggle to find words. Irene was also widely feared, famous for bouts of temper in which she might hurl a chalk eraser or turn a student's desk over, spilling its contents across the floor. If you were stood in the corner in Miss Bachmeyer's room, you were unlikely to misbehave again. Even Principal Linquist cowered in her presence. <coughs> she was 50 if she was a day, sturdy, with a rare shock of snow-white hair, wild eyebrows, bloodshot bluish eyes, and a bulbous nose that in anyone else would indicate a predilection for drink or prize fighting. Her families were members of the Baha'i faith who fled Germany to escape persecution, I'd been told. But you'd be hard put to detect any religion in her, not unlike a nun or two who taught me in grade school. 
Esther is speaking up, relieving me. She's not afraid of anyone, it seems. Well, generally speaking, we want to widen the children's horizons, turn them into good and useful citizens, don't we? Isn't that the teacher's role? Not to them both. In any case, their rivalry may have gone far to explain the tension evident between them. Though they were the same height, a good head taller than me, they didn't see eye to eye on anything. And though they were both German, they addressed each other stiffly and never in their native tongue. There's nothing wrong with a little disorder and the occasional detour, Esther says, addressing me. That's how discoveries are made. Esther likes a good argument. I could listen to her for hours, I'm sure of it. Her voice is melodious with a lilt from the old country, but there's something decidedly exotic about her that I can't quite place. Her hazel hooded eyes, fine prominent nose, and full lips, her dark brown hair bound in a French twist at the nape of her long neck. Today she's wearing a knit suit with three-quarter sleeves, its camel, the color of the desert, with a small collar and a belted waist. The suit clings to her body, which is thin, but her arms are muscular and covered in bracelets that slide up and down like musical <coughs> instruments. Her manicured <coughs> hands, almost outsized in appearance, are adorned with rings, and there's a delicate gold chain around her neck but its pendant is tucked in, hidden from sight, as is so much about her. She pulls you in with her warmth, and there is a tentativeness and humor in her eyes. And yet there's something private, even guarded, in how she carries herself, how she chooses her words. I'm dying to find out more about her, and if truth be told, to have her to myself. I could ask her over for dinner, runs through my mind. Well, one day. I've got much too much learning before I can even think of socializing. As dusk falls, school books unopened on my desk. I start <coughs> staring at the old elm outside the window and find Esther Jonas in the telephone book. I take the liberty of giving her a call. Hello, she says. Her voice is softer than I remember and worn with sleep. I must have woken her from a well-deserved nap. It's Karen, Karen Murphy. Karen, what a lovely surprise, she says, but she doesn't sound surprised to hear from me. I was wondering if I could see you this weekend. My voice sounds anxious, more earnest than I intend, I intend as if I've dialed emergency. Well, it is a matter of life and death in a way. Is everything all right, Karen? She sounds less concerned than amused, I think. It turns out she has plans already, but she's inviting me along. She was thinking of asking me anyway, she says. Esther is taking me to Chicago. She has friends there, also teachers. We'll take a walk along the lake and then meet them for dinner. I put the phone down and float back to my desk, set to work on the founding fathers with new purpose, find myself humming. So the book takes place in uh, your hometown. The wild girl in the book is called Liddy. Um, there are a lot of German issues in it. Uh, the whole book. The whole story is a lesbian love story. So there's a lot of autobiog autobiographical details and stuff in there. How hard or easy was it to, to put all, to use your own life and details from your own life to put into, into the book? Was it stressful or was it, or did you enjoy it? Or both? Nothing stressful about that. That was the joy of the book. The, um, the ease of the book was writing about this world, um, kind of a nostalgia for this world that I um, grew up in. And I have to say, I was thinking about this, 
My most vivid memories are of my grade school years. I don't know about any of you, um, but if you show me a picture of my class photo photos from my year in any in any of my grade <coughs> school years, I can tell you the names of all my fellow children, all the teachers. I have very very vivid memories of them, and uh, so that was the joy of it, returning to a place um, which was also a happy time for me. I have to admit I had a happy childhood. I know it's embarrassing. <laughs> um, do I have a cough drop? Yeah. yeah. When you read out. Um... Okay. Um, yeah, so that was the joy of, of, of writing this. So um, that is autobiographical. It is my hometown. Uh, many of the teachers in the book, many of the children are... Um, I, I use characteristics of people from my childhood and the teachers and family, um, but the work itself is a complete fantasy. This isn't um, an autobiographical book by any means, although I had fun with the character of Liddy and I did have a fifth grade teacher who was the only um, youthful teacher in the school, um, a young, lovely young teacher who I loved to torture as best I could to get attention from her in any way I could. <laughs> yeah, but we'll talk about it. Yeah, well, well, teachers yeah now. now. No, why not now? Because okay. you've been mentioning teachers yeah. now several times. So, yeah. so why did you choose the profession of teaching or, or the calling of teaching as the main subject of the book? Right. Um, there are two parts to that. Um, Teaching, I, I described that um, my, my vivid memories of my own years as a student, um, but I also did do a teaching sequence. I have a teaching degree, and so I did spend a lot of time uh, in the classroom, not as a um, teacher, hired teacher, but as a substitute teacher in the New York City public school system. Um, through, throughout the period, a number of years when I was finishing my higher degrees, um, college and graduate school degrees. I found it a very nice and easy way to make money. Um, so I didn't have the responsibilities of a full-time teacher, but I could observe um, the inner workings of the education system, um, teachers' lives, and stu children. Uh, I loved watching the children, especially in the playground, and so uh, I do have quite an attachment to the education field and um, also to the teachers' room and listening to teachers and children. So that um, was a reason I was very interested, is particularly in um, creating scenes in the classroom, uh, because I thought it was quite fascinating how teachers really operated operate and, and to be inside their head um, was a lot of fun and um, also familiar to me as an actress because you certainly need some similar skills as a teacher as, as you do when you're a performer if you're going to um, gain and keep the attention of children. And then something special for me is that I grew up at the end of an era in um, the history of teaching in America. And what I'm about to tell you, I learned from a wonderful young historian named Rachel, Rachel Rosenberg, who is actually a scholar of women teachers' lives in the, America in the 20th century. And um, I didn't know any of this when I wrote the novel, but what I did know was that all of my teachers, without exception, were unmarried women. Most of them, to me, they appeared elderly. They may have been in late middle age and older. And um, so, so I, I was fascinated about depicting their lives. 
and um, wondering about their lives because in popular culture these teachers who are identified as spinster teachers often are figures of ridicule or pathos. Um, they're often seen as uh, sexually repressed, as um, taking out their frustrations on the children, or um, lavishing them with unnatural passions. These are the images we have from popular culture about these teachers. Um, and I wanted to really look at their, to, to, to portray them in their full humanity and with their passions. And, and I learned from uh, Rachel Rosenberg that this marriage ban is a very central feature of American teaching history. And it was only for women, of course. But um, let me begin in the 1830s at a time when um, America was, from its founding days through the early 1800s, women were actually encouraged to be teachers because it was thought that that would prepare them for married life, make them better mothers. And so um, they were encouraged to teach. Um, and the problem was that they didn't leave the profession. Many of them preferred to teach than to get married and raise a family. So by the late 1800s, um, all over the country, marriage bans were put in place because they decided this wasn't, this wasn't good. They wanted women at home raising families, which is where they belonged. So um, different, these were local and um, state and local laws, but they were really widespread all over the country. Two, two forms of marriage bans were in place for teachers. The one was that um, women who were married could not teach, and the second was that teachers who married had to leave the profession. And this ban naturally um, was in, led, as you might imagine, to a particular type of woman entering the profession and staying there. These were women who were devoted to teaching and often women who had no intention or desire to marry a man. And as we learned from Lillian Faderman, one of our leading um, LGBTQ history um, historians in America, there was a large percentage of lesbians in the teaching profession. Um, goes without saying, when we know the history of the marriage ban, for example. Um, by, by the 1950s, um, marriage bans were being lifted all over the country. In fact, until the Civil Rights Act in 1964, the, there were dis discrimination was still possible. It was only then that a marriage ban were actually eliminated. But by the post-war period, um, married women were allowed into the profession and it began to change. It just so happens in my town, I had the luck of um, having these teachers who were still there, these older now unmarried women were still my teachers. And so um, that's a little of the background of the teachers, and I just found them fascinating, and I wanted to understand their lives. And so the first thought that came to me in terms of the idea of writing a novel, what would be the topic, this was just automatically the theme and the world that I wanted to enter for a work of fiction. And you made them all fascinating. <laughs> Thank There's you. a handful of teachers, and they're all really interesting characters. But before we talk about why, we, why you put the novel in the year 1963. Uh, let's hear the chapters 8 and 9, please. Okay. Six, eight, eight, one. Okay. one more thing, I had forgotten to mention that um, two, of the, um, three, two of the three central characters are actually German women, and, and you heard that in the first scenes, um, but 
because in, in the Midwest where I grew up, um, the largest um, immigration, immigrant group were Northern Europeans. Um, the town was almost completely white, apart from Mexican workers who would come in um, to work at the Del Monte corn fields um, in the summer. Um, and uh, apart from the students who came in from Chicago and other cities, um, but they always left on the weekends. And so it was a very white place. It was very Northern European. And a majority of the immigrants were um, Swedes, Norwegians, and mostly German immigrants. So it would not have been unusual. And in my school, in fact, one of the most terrifying teachers' name was Miss Bredehorst, upon whom my teacher Irene uh, Bachmeier is based. Anyway, mention that. Okay. So, what you need to know is that Esther did go to Chicago. Uh, I'm sorry, Karen did go to Chicago with Esther. Um, it was an exciting adventure for her. She met friends of Esther in Chicago, another two women. Um, and she continues to teach. She has um, experiences in the classroom. We meet other teachers in the teacher's room. So um, slowly we're building this world up that she's living in. And then this happens. Esther and I are having dinner at my place. I've got her here in my clapboard house, just where I've wanted her. We're sitting at the kitchen table, just as I imagined it. Dusk enters through the open door. It's unusually warm. Esther slips off her cardigan and smiles at me. She fans herself and laughs. She's biting the nail of her thumb and watching me. I grip the sides of my chair to stop myself from climbing over the table. I'll kiss her at the first opportunity, I'm thinking. I'm in love, and I'll tell her as much when the moment is right. These are my thoughts, but what I say is, I've created a lesson plan on the origins of man. Oh, she says surprised, and she's her old self again, confident, in charge. Don't mention evolution, whatever you do. Why not? Well, it's not against the law in this state, but you'll spare yourself a lot of bother if you avoid the subject. What she means is there are church groups in town who refuse to accept that we come from the apes, including some parents in the PTA. They've been fighting evolution all the way to the state house, but I won't let their ignorance stop me. No one can stop you, Esther says, reading my mind, and not for the first time. She's one step ahead of me in everything. Teach whatever you want to teach. Just don't use the word evolution. Call it something else. She wipes her mouth daintily, then pushes her plate away. She looks down at her hands, which are now clasped in her lap, and then up at me. She seems to be expecting something, dessert perhaps, and I'm kicking myself that I didn't stop at Davison's for a cake on the way home. Shall I begin in the sea or on land? What do you think, Esther? I ask, as if words have any meaning at all. Esther smiles and frowns at the same time. I don't want to talk about work, dear Karen. Is that all right? Of course, I say too quickly. Or anything outside this room. No, I say, shaking my head vehemently. I get up and close the door and sit back down. We sit in silence, watching each other. I'd just like to look at you if you don't mind. No, I don't mind. <laughs> the only sound is our breathing which is heavy. I feel her chest rise and fall and sink with mine. Esther places her strong jeweled hands on the table. I do the same. Two sets of hands reach furtively for each other. Yes, I am awake, and Esther and I are holding hands 
across a vast expanse of time and place and a clutter of dishes, wine glasses, and cutlery. You've hardly touched your spaghetti, I managed to say. No. Our hands are clenched now. We'll fall off the earth if we let go. Didn't you like it, the spaghetti? <laughs> I'll have it in the morning, she says, barely above a whisper. It settled then, and didn't the nuns teach us patience was a virtue? We push our chairs away from the table and get up in slow motion, holding back for an instant from the inevitable. But then we're in each other's arms, and we stay there, clasped together in my kitchen, as our bodies discover each other. Climbing the stairs up to my bed would separate us too violently. I take in her scent, which is for all the world like fresh snow, and kiss her neck and full lips, and then her mouth opens. It's thrilling inside her mouth. Her tongue is soft and firm at once, achingly sweeter than I could have imagined. And God knows I've been imagining her tongue in my mouth for weeks. I release her hair, and as it falls thick and wild around her face, I have to gasp because she is so beautiful. And as our breathing turns to moaning, I do lead her upstairs. The night sky turns golden, and trumpets blare, and I understand that what is happening was written from the first moment in the teacher's room. Nothing will ever be the same. We drift off to sleep near dawn, but she wakes quickly with a start. She has to leave, she says, but I won't hear of it. I pull her close under me and hold her with my thighs. It's time, I say. You're going to tell me that story of yours. She turns her head away, but I'm determined. The fact is I know next to nothing about this school teacher whom I love. I take her face in my hands. Speak, I order. But her mouth finds mine and offers not words but Dionysian wine. As she dresses and readies to leave, she tells me she prefers to live in the present. Let me be a mystery for now, Karen, she begs me, half joking, half serious. We have to take things slowly, she says, so as not to lose our heads. She'll call as soon as she can. Days pass in which she greets me in the hallway or the teacher's room like a friendly, distant colleague. I invite her to dinner, but she politely declines and hopes she can take a rain check, she says. And then the charade becomes too much for me. I stop outside the door to her classroom, which is always open, she has nothing to hide, she says, and peer in. The children are lined along the windows, carrying clipboards and pencils, straining for a view, some on chairs, the others on tiptoes. Esther is standing behind them. Look up at the sky, children. What do you observe this morning? There's authority and ease in her stance, her voice exacting and yielding at once. Clouds, Miss Jonas, they call out. Cirrus, stratus, or cumulus? Cumulus. Will it rain? No. Why not? The clouds are white. The children respond as one, well-mannered, content with themselves. Take your time with your sketches, she tells them. She turns to look up at the clock and notices me. I've caught her by surprise. She bows her head and makes her way purposely to where I'm standing in the doorway. I'm longing for you, I tell her under my breath. There's a flash of irritation in her eyes, which are scanning the hallway. It will all work out, she says with a breezy air, like a nurse calming a patient. She steps back into her room, glances back at me with a sigh and closes the door gently but firmly behind her. I stand like a naughty child outside Esther's door, unsure where to turn. I've committed a cardinal sin by intruding on her lesson. Her classroom is sacred territory after all. Thankfully, the hall is empty, 
I circle the length of it, make my way back up to my room, and wait for the children to come up from gym. I realize with a sinking feeling she may not want to see me again, that what I've done may be unforgivable. unforgivable. I stay after school, preparing next week's lessons, an exercise in futility with Liddy in the room, but it keeps me busy. I take the long way home and spend what's left of the day mopping the floors, anything to take my mind off my serious folly. I'm about to collapse into bed when the phone rings, and it's Esther calling to ask if she can come over right away within the hour, if I'm not busy, that is. Two hours later, two hours I spend motionless on my couch, rendered helpless by anticipation, ears pricked for the slightest sign of her, for the screech of her tires, the click of her heels on the front path, the jangle of her bracelets, there's a soft tapping at my door, seemingly out of nowhere. She's panting, catching her breath. The look in her eyes is that of a hungry beggar. If she had an empty bowl, I would fill it to heaping. She's parked on the next block, she says, closing the door quickly behind her, and walked over so as not to draw attention. She insists we close the windows, lower the blinds, she arranges her books on a table <coughs> as if we're getting down to work and turns up the volume on the radio. Okay, she says, undressing me. We're safe. Safe from what? I want to ask. What is there to fear? But I can't form words. I can barely stand. You're safe with me, I manage to say, as I lead her up to my bed. But safe is the last thing I'm feeling. My desire for Esther is rock with danger, the danger of losing control. In fact, I've abandoned reason and every other faculty that holds a school teacher together. I go ape in her arms. I babble and shriek. Below my bedroom window, a car pulls into the driveway. Esther jolts up in the bed. Esther, it's okay. I'm laughing delirious with loving. It's only Bill, my neighbor, coming home from the late shift at Wurlitzer's. <coughs> I reach for her, but she resists and pulls the cover tight around her. It's a very small town. People here notice everything, even things they don't understand and can't explain. It's nobody's business how we lead our lives, I assure her. I'm desperate to have her back in my arms. My body is bereft, but she's not convinced and keeps her distance. She seems startled, in fact. She's looking at me as if I said the world was flat. Your life is not your own, Karen. Surely you know that. You're a school teacher, a pillar of the community, a moral authority, whether you like it or not. I'm panting, tongue hanging. I'm not in the proper state of mind. A teacher should be judged by her behavior in the classroom, I answer, my own behavior in the classroom notwithstanding. Esther looks up at the ceiling, then down. She clasps her hands. I can't tell if she's at a loss for words or praying. She gets up from the bed and walks to the window, glancing out from behind the curtain, satisfied that Bill is not lurking outside. She sits on the nearby chair, and takes me in with a perplexed expression. We're like those nuns of yours. They put us on a pedestal. We live for the children and the children alone. One false step, Karen, and down you fall. Even the slightest deviation can compromise your standing in the town and lead to your undoing. Our present conduct is grounds for dismissal. Esther's words are preposterous to me. Love is one thing, work is another. My life is my own. I refuse to care what other people think. But I don't say anything. I nod my head. I'd stand on my head if I could. Anything to get her back in my bed. Her brow is still furrowed, but she's coming round. She's in my arms. We make love. <coughs> the whole
holiest of acts, heart pounding against heart, a pure communion. We are not immoral, I inform her as we calm. Our conduct is a form of devotion. That does it apparently. Esther is sitting up purposefully. I want to tell you a story, Karen. It doesn't have a happy ending, I'm afraid. takes place in the year 1963, within six or seven months in the fall and winter and the early spring of 1964. Right. We all know that President Kennedy was shot in November of that year, but that was not the main reason you chose that year, I assume. There's many more issues that have to deal with a, a change in American society around that year, right? Wrong. <laughs> <laughs> I did choose, I actually chose the year because of Kennedy's assassination. Because personally and in terms of the world of the book, I don't think there's a child alive who was in school at the time who doesn't remember the day. It was a Friday, early afternoon, when the news came in that uh, President Kennedy had Kennedy had been assassinated. So it was a very visceral memory for me, although I'm a bit younger than the character and characters in this book. I was in first grade, I think. Um, so that, that felt like an incredibly important moment because for me, I think it also was the end of a youthful optimism in, in American society. Um, it was a, a huge shift. And of course, 1963 was also a, um, a year with many other social, socially important um, aspects. We can, take, we can go back to 19, uh, February of 1963, when the feminine mystique by Betty Friedan was published, which um, caused a sensation because, you know, for the first time, uh, uh, the, this, this image and mythology about the, the happy, contented housewife and mother was um, being challenged. Um, and the suggestion was that women's might not be fulfilled by lives as wives and mothers only. And um, in fact, it might be making plenty of them rather ill and, um, you know, and um, emotionally and um, even mentally um, debilitating for them not to fulfill themselves in any way beyond that of the mother. Um, but we, all, we, also, we also feel that the younger teachers and the younger women in the novel are unhappy with what's going on in society, and they would like to see change. And the older ones are, you know, clinging to what is and what has been. So that, 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 that there's change in the air, oh, that yes. parades the yeah. entire novel. Yeah, yeah. of course. Um, in August of 1963, the March on Washington took place, and Martin Luther King's famous I Have a Dream speech. And several months later, there was the, um, bombings of a church in Birmingham and four little schoolgirls, in fact the age of um, Karen's student children, um, were, were murdered in that attack. So that's a very, um, all kinds of, um, and the, the, most of those things were happening in the South. Um, and in the Midwest, yes, in this um, little, this world of, um, in this small town where the people are white and where um, social upheaval is not present in everyday life, some of the elderly teachers or some of the towns, many of the townspeople could um, try to um, pretend that things weren't changing, but, but of course they were. And um, 
So it, it felt like a year um, that uh, was, I also like years, um, sort of pre-cusp years, when we think of LGBT rights and so on, we think of the Stonewall era, which began in uh, 1968. Um, but of course there were, there were um, uh, things happening, there, were, there was a movement, a, a very quiet uh, um, movement, but an active one of um, LGBT people coming together um, in this period as well. And, and that we see some of in this book, of course, later too. But, but things are a little bit under the surface and about to explode. And then with Kennedy's assassination, everything, the whole culture turns upside down. Um, the whole mythology um, of the um, a, a, a land, a young, a young country full of hope um, and possibility is shattered in that moment. So let's hear how the news of Kennedy's okay. assassination reaches the school. Okay. Chapter 14. Okay. We've had lunch and recess and the children are working more or less quietly in their math books when Will pokes his head into the room and asks me to step outside. He's pale as a ghost. What's happened, Will, I ask him. He tells me quietly, his voice breaking, that the president's been shot in Dallas. The reports are saying he's dead. He's been assassinated. I should send the children home and report to his office for our Friday meeting. Dorothy's informing the parents, he says. Oh God, I hear myself answer. If you prefer, I can tell them, Karen. No, I'll do it, I say. Will squeezes my hand and rushes off. I take a moment to draw a breath and another moment to quiet my nerves because I'm shaking and re-enter the room which is decidedly noisier than when I left it. I float above the room and watch myself ask the children to put their books away, please, and hear myself telling them I have very sad news. Children, I begin. President Kennedy, I can't go on. His name evokes life itself and all that is new and fresh, not death. The President, I start again. <coughs> has died today, and so we have decided to stop school early and send you home. Your parents have been informed. We'll talk about what a great man he was next week. The children are studying me with a curious expression. Are you crying, Miss Murphy? Our caring Nancy asks. I realize, I realize she's right, and my face is wet. Yes, honey, I'm, I'm very sad, I managed to say. Despite my best efforts, I'm crying openly. I hear a sob from the back of the room, and another, and the children one by one are joining in. Some have their heads in their arms, but most are looking at me with piteous expressions, tears rolling down their cheeks, and I realize they're crying because I'm frightening them, not because of the president. I find a tissue in my sweater pocket, and quickly wipe my eyes and blow my nose. I see that you are sad too, children. That's why we're all going home. Gather your things and line up, please. I move to the door and wait, trying not to think about the terrible news or anything at all. The children gather their things in slow motion, wordlessly, and form a line in front of me. Despite my best efforts, an image of the president's smiling face floats in front of my eyes, and the tears well up again. I take a deep breath and tell myself that if I am going to be a teacher, I must shape up and find some self-control immediately. This seems to do the trick, because the next thing I know, I'm ushering my children out of the building and sending them home. I make my way slowly back up the school steps to the principal's office. The sun beats down mercilessly. 
As I reach the hallway, I hear wailing and then a stifled scream and the thump of someone falling and ensuing commotion. Across from the office, Dorothy and Joan are kneeling over Marilyn, the kindergarten teacher, who appears to have fainted clean away. Esther is waiting for me in the doorway. I allow myself to fall into her arms. Then Louise comes bounding down the hall and into her arms as well, and Esther is doing her best to hold us both. I can feel her heart beating wildly. Joan and Dorothy half carry Marilyn, who's come to and is moaning in agony, into the office, and the O'Connor sisters, Noreen and Margaret, who rushed up from their first and second grade classrooms, help them get, into, get her onto the couch. We're all gathered now in the small office, red-eyed, shaking our heads, wringing our hands, covering our faces, openly crying. First grade teacher and director of the school's Christmas play, Natalia Craddock, excuses herself with large, tragic gestures, but the rest of us remain, and one by one we quiet as Will adjusts his small transistor radio, and we strain to listen as the reports come in. For a time, there is no more news, and the terrible story repeats itself. Christine Olson, third grade teacher and sports instructor, turns her back to us, pressing her fists into the wall, her tall frame shaking. Irene is the first to speak. He had the makings of a very great president. Her stern tone is softened by grief. We heard him speak at the Egyptian in 59, didn't we, Christine? We knew he'd be president, Christine says, turning back towards us, her voice choked. Everyone who saw him did. He was our great hope. Oh my God, Margaret says over and over, holding tightly to her sister. Too young, too young, her sister Noreen says. Celia James, second grade, is speaking up with quiet poise. There'll never be another like him, nor the first lady, poor woman. They brought such style, such grace to the White House. He was a god, Marilyn cries out. Too good for this world. That's why they had to kill him. Let's not rush to judge <coughs> the hunt, Dorothy says. The truth will come out soon enough. We just have to be patient and stay calm. But now our school's calm and practical secretary has broken down and can't go on. I put my arm around her shaking shoulders. More details filter in from the transistor static. The president's death is officially confirmed. No, it's not real, Marilyn shouts at the radio. It's a lie. They made it up. It's a bad joke. It's a bad dream. It's a mistake. Turn up the radio, Will. They'll tell us. You'll see. It never happened. It can't be true. It can't be. It can't. God, let it not be true. New details emerge. Lyndon B. Johnson will be sworn in as the 36th President of the United States. We listen in silence, covering our mouths, holding our foreheads, wringing our hands. Will speaks up, his voice just above a whisper. I say we head on home, ladies. Call off this week's meeting, unless there is anything pressing. He looks around at us. We can barely shake our heads. How shall we explain this to the children? It's Esther stopping us. The children had slipped our minds. We've got the weekend to think about it, Dorothy reminds us. Thank God, Marilyn says. I couldn't face them tomorrow. The parents will decide what to tell them, Irene says. But it's our duty, isn't it? I ask. I look around at shrugging shoulders, shaking heads and lowered eyes. No one's speaking up. The only sound is a chorus of sighs. Not everyone had such a high opinion of him, Joan says, finally. I hate to bring it up. My father, for one. Despite Irish pride in our first Irish Catholic president and my mother's quiet devotion, we all suspected he had broken ranks and voted for Nixon. His tirades in front of the nightly news 
confirm the suspicion. I won't go home for Thanksgiving, I decide. I'll stay where I belong, with Esther. We sink back into silence, and though the meeting's been adjourned, we stay where we are in the small office, numbed by shock, confused as to how to move forward, helpless to take action, waiting for some kind of instruction, but none is forthcoming. Greg Jordan, sixth grade teacher, slips into the room, late as usual, and stands behind us. Sorry, he says to no one in particular, bowing his head. Karen's right, Will says, speaking up with sudden resolve. It's our duty to talk to the children. We'll have an assembly first thing on Monday morning. Bring your children to the gym. He gulps back a sob, and Dorothy pats him on the back like he's a baby. The prospect of Monday's meeting gets us onto our feet. Slowly we find our balance. We make our way down the large central staircase, weary and broken, hanging onto the railing as if we'd been cast about in a great storm and landed in a place of utter devastation. We don't have an assembly on Monday. President Lyndon B. Johnson has declared Monday a day of national mourning. Louise and I <coughs> join her roommates in the boarding house in front of the television set to watch the funeral. We gang up on the couch and floor. Seven stunned young women, teachers, nurses, just starting our lives, unable to fathom what we are witnessing, which is the end of the world as we know it, the end of goodness. It feels like we've been robbed, or worse, our dreams are gutted. I'm grateful not to be alone. Esther's left to visit an old friend. I would have crawled into her arms to seek my comfort, but perhaps it's better in the end to be here with my peers. Esther's very sad, but she's not shocked like the rest of us. She's troubled, but resigned, as if it were inevitable. The world can be a very dark place, she tells me, and for now darkness has won out again. Dorothy is waiting at the top of the stairs as we arrive at work on Tuesday to inform us the idea of an assembly has been nixed altogether. Will has decided it's best to move on and not to talk to the children about the assassination of our president. She catches my eye and shrugs. I find I'm not surprised. The list of off-limit topics at the school keeps growing in keeping with the tensions in the country at large. I'll talk to the children myself, I decide. But Tuesday morning comes and goes, and I haven't mentioned the president once. I'll wait until the time is right. The children are happy to be back at school, away from the shock and despair and the constant news. I say nothing on Tuesday afternoon and nothing on Wednesday either. My lesson on Thanksgiving goes out the window too. I don't have the heart. Thank you very much, Lydia. I think we'll open up to the audience. Uh, Tosin, can we have a light there so I can see? Are there any questions out there? Would you like to ask a question? No one. <laughs> okay, I have a last question. Oh, there's somebody? Please. <clears throat> Thank you very much. <clears throat> all, the, uh, all the pain comes right back from November 1963. I was seven years old. So for all of us, that was such a touchstone. <clears throat> and not just the end of our... It was the end of our childhoods. It was the end of a small world that we know as children. <clears throat> and suddenly we saw ourselves in the context of this big fright. And so thank you for evoking that's so powerful and beautiful. Thank you. I should mention, I forgot to say this when we were talking about 1963, that in 1962 we had the Cuban Missile Crisis, which we're all hearing about quite a bit today. And um, probably you remember that um, we were all 
We had dis dis disaster drills in our school, <laughs> and we watched um, films about what to do in the case of an uh, atom bomb, and uh, we had to get under our desks in disaster drills and cover our heads. And there's a scene in the book later on um, in which I um, describe the um, experience of the disaster drill and um, the teacher's decision to talk to the students, the children, about a nuclear annihilation. <laughs> Doesn't quite go as planned, I'll say that. Um, but so, you know, there had been that, of course, and of course, you know, we I don't know if you remember <laughs> listening to those um, demonstration tapes about, that were kind of cartoon Sure, duck, duck cartoon and cover. Characters. Duck, yeah. duck and cover. Duck and cover. As called. long as you were under your desk, you, you were, were going to be okay. Yeah. Yeah, you, and the turtle was there. To show yeah, we, it was an animated um, cartoon turtle that gave us the instructions as to how we would survive the nuclear bomb. We, we see the news today. I have some young children. Mm -hmm. And just as those were moments in our childhood, that were the bridge mm -hmm. from our smaller worlds to a bigger. You know, today, whether it was COVID, whether it's Ukraine, you know, right. these, these, are, these are being burned into their consciousnesses. Absolutely. And fast forward, if they write <laughs> or compose or just remember someday, of course. Uh, they'll have the same effect that those moments you described have on us. Yeah. And those are shared moments. Yes. So, as you were describing the memories in the book, um, it was absolutely a page from my biography, our collective yeah. biography. Yeah. Yeah. Very beautiful. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. And that, that's also something special about setting a, a, a novel in, 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 the te in, the, in the school, because all these world events are seen through the prism of this one school in a small town. In, most often th one classroom in this small school. Um, but it is the collective site of um, our American history and our culture. And of course there were low, all kinds of debates, and there always have been and there continue to be about what could be taught in the classroom. I, I recently watched To Sir With Love mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. with Sidney Poitier, yeah. <laughs> and so much of that movie unfolds in the teacher's room. Yeah, yeah And uh, true. it's a different set of issues, but yeah. again, it's the crucible yeah. in which the, the times are being yeah. students and teachers challenged by their time. And, and that reminds me of something you asked that I forgot to mention, that, um, you know, teachers in America are all, you know, teachers have, have, a, have it rough. They're, you know, they're often criticized for everything that goes wrong in a culture, in a society. And um, often they also, you know, the majority of teachers at this time were white women. And they're, um, so, so a lot has been written about um, the propagation of racist ideology in the classroom and a false narration of history. And of course it was these teachers who were um, basically um, reading out of the textbooks for the most part, and the te textbooks were, yes, full of um, ideologies and narrations that today we find um, wrong and even revolting. Um, but I, I have to say, because I mentioned the, te the marriage ban, I should also have mentioned the teachers' lives and bodies were policed on every front, and so that it was not only a question of them not being able to marry, certainly they couldn't have any relationships, whether it was with women or men, um, they had to dress, there was a dress code, they had to dress a certain way. Um, they could only talk about certain issues in the classroom, and um, teachers, if they would have gone out to protests um, actively and have been seen, they would have been fired. So teachers who did um, feel that there was something wrong and they wanted to express something about 
the possibility, possibilities of change, had to be very subtle about it um, and careful because they were observed and policed at every turn. So um, I think that's important to remember about, about the lives of teachers. That, um, and, uh, yeah. yeah. So I have a very last question before we come to the end. Mm -hmm. Will there be another novel, or are you going to come back to the theater? Mm -hmm. I would love to have another play. <laughs> so what's going to happen? Do you know already, or are you working on something? Quite honestly, um, <coughs> I'm, I'm too, uh, a bit too devastated by world events <laughs> to um, uh, think, think beyond them right now. I, I, I would like to try another novel, you know, I had, and in the end, I really enjoyed, I enjoyed this other form, so um, I'd like to imagine that there might be another book, but it's, and there are some ideas, of course, but I, uh, right now, I'm not working on a new novel. And as for the theater, uh, it's always there, and uh, um, I'm sure there will be more theater work to come as well. Right. So let's try and find funding for a production of peace. I would love to do peace here at the English State of Berlin. It's so prominent and it's so that issue is so big right now. So uh, the book is The Teacher's Room. Uh, the writer is Lydia Strike. There is a book table out there in the foyer. You can buy the book. Lydia will be more than happy to sign it. I would like to thank the American Embassy for supporting us. Uh, I would like to thank Torsten and John for helping out here, and of course Lydia, thank you very much, and all of you, thank you. Thank you.